This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. A food safety expert talks about peanut butter, GMOs, and the connection between chocolate and genocide. A prominent professor denounces the movement to boycott, divest, and sanction Israeli universities. And Bill Press talks 2016 politics with Stephen Shepard of Politico. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Our food safety system is 100 years old and broken, says Professor Courtney Thomas. And she says it's crazy because selling salmonella infected peanut butter is not against the law. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Courtney Thomas is a visiting assistant professor of political science at Virginia Tech University. Her research interests include international political economy, food safety and security, genocide studies, and public policy. Dr. Thomas is currently focusing on food politics and has written a book called In Food We Trust. Dr. Courtney Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks for having me. Well, it's our pleasure. Uh, so what is the state of, of food safety today, a century after the first laws were passed? The, the food safety system in the United States today is woefully antiquated. Um, we, we have far more outbreaks of food safety illnesses or foodborne illnesses in this country than we should. We have way too many people getting sick. We have far too many hours of worker productivity lost. Um, the, the food safety system in this, in this country is really a century behind. It's a century behind where it should be or where it could be. Now, even if we cleaned up farms and food factories in the United States, aren't we still at risk from, from all the food imported from, say, Central America, China, Southeast Asia? Certainly. Food, food imports are definitely a risk. And, you know, every time Congress decides to deal with this issue, it tends to focus its attention on imported foods. And don't get me wrong, there, there's definitely a risk to imported foods. But um, there, there are some things to think about to shift the attention back domestically. The first is that while the United States does import a good amount of its food, it doesn't tend to import the foods that are most concerning in terms of foodborne illnesses. Um, the second thing is that you know China has, has some issues with its food system. It is working to correct those, um, and that's going to take some time, certainly. But you know, as they try to make those changes and make those corrections, they are doing it with information from the International Food Safety Association, the Codex Alimentarius Commission. They are trying to, to make updates to their food system that are in accordance with the best scientific knowledge that is out there. And you know, we're, we haven't done that. We haven't made that move domestically. And so, yes, imported foods are certainly a risk. But honestly, if you look at the numbers, most of the foodborne illnesses that people contract in the United States, they contract from food that is produced domestically. You suggest in your book that the difference between the ideal regime of food safety and the reality lies in the political clout that the gigantic food companies have with the government. What are some examples of that? Okay, so um, there there have been moments in U.S. history, the, the turn of the 20th century and then a couple of years ago um, with the passage of the Food Safety Modernization Act, where food companies in this country have realized that it is in their best interest to promote food safety regulation. And at the moment that large food producers realize that it is in their economic interest to promote food safety, either because it helps them to push out of the marketplace competitive who cannot afford to put into place the food safety systems and regimes that are required by law, or because it allows them to pass blame for food safety outbreaks onto the government instead of onto their own, onto their own companies and their own and their own factories. You see a lot of movement to support food safety legislation from the large agribusinesses, but most of the time and throughout the entire 20th century, agribusiness in this country made a concerted effort to prevent federal food safety regulation from becoming more appropriate in terms especially of microbial food safety. 
And so what you see is, and, and we saw this even in, 2000, in 2011 with the passage of the Food Safety Modernization Act, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which is one of the largest lobbying groups in this country for the beef industry, put a huge amount of, of resistance, put up a huge amount of resistance to the passage of this legislation. And what's, what's so frustrating about that is that the Food Safety Modernization Act doesn't regulate the beef industry. The beef industry is regulated by the USDA. The Food Safety Modernization Act only covered the statutory authority of the Food and Drug Administration. And th so even though this legislation was not going to impact them, the National Cattlemen beef, Cattlemen's Beef Association still opposed efforts to update the food safety system, um, probably because they saw this as a slippery slope to the regulation of their own industry, to the changes in regulation of their own industry. Um, but what you see in this country over time is that food companies don't want federal mandates that they change their practices, even though we know, and we know from international data, we know from our own experiences with companies in this country that have voluntarily imposed the best food safety practices, we know that food safety gives us a, an economic advantage. It saves us money in the long run. And yet the large, the large food companies have still resisted efforts to regulate the, the, food, the food safety on a national level. Mm. You would think that you would have everything in, under one department as opposed to spreading it out. You know, it's, it's the FDA for this. It's you know, somebody else for this in terms of regulating our food. Why, you, I don't understand why it would be in different places like that. Just... Neither does anyone else. <laughs> but you have to go back, and you you, you really have to go back to the uh, to the early 20th century to understand what happened there. Um, when the when the United States passed food safety legislation for the first time in the early 20th century, they were desperately trying to get legislation passed. Their their objective was to get something passed, and they had been thwarted, and there had been setbacks just constantly for 20 years. 20 years of attempts to make this happen that hadn't gone through. And so um, the, the real mover and shaker, the father of food safety regulation in the United States, Dr. Wiley, finally was able to push forward two different pieces of legislation to govern two different parts of the food system. The first was um, the, the, the Meat Inspection Act, and that came after Upton Sinclair published The Jungle, and people got an inside view into what meat production in this country really looked like, and it was nauseating and it was terrifying. Um, and that ended up being under the regulation of the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, because the USDA already had relationships with farmers. It already had relationships with meat producers, and so it seemed like it would be logical to give them the authority to, to implement these new regulations because they already had that social capital um, invested in the agriculture sector. When the, food, when, when the, when the rest of the food safety um, system was, the food system was regulated, there was actually a new federal agency created, the Department of Chemistry, and that ends up eventually becoming the FDA under, the, under, under a different regulatory framework. And so it goes back to expediency in the early 20th century, and we haven't changed it. Hmm. We're speaking with Courtney Thomas, visiting assistant professor of political science at Virginia Tech University. Uh, her wide range of interests uh, or research interests, uh, including international political economy, food safety and security, genocide studies, public policy. And Dr. Thomas is currently focusing on food politics and has written a book called In Food We Trust. You know, I, I would think, Doctor, that that's, consumers would like to know who controls our food marketplace. Is it agribusiness or is, is it the, the huge supermarket chain? It's both. Um, you know, there are a very small number of food producers in this country. Um, I, I, I love to show um, a particular graphic that was published, I think it was the Washington Post a couple of years ago, that actually shows all of the different brands and which companies own those. And, you know, Nestle and General Mills and uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, the, these, there, there are a very few number of food producers that own just massive numbers of food brands. So to a certain extent, yes, it is the agribusinesses that control most of the country's food supply. But on the other hand, the, the, the food, the supermarket chains have an important role to play in this as well because consumers have a tendency when they get sick from consuming a food to blame two places, 
They put blame on the supermarket where they purchased the food, or they put blame on the company whose brand is on the product that made them sick. And so supermarket chains have a huge vested interest in making sure that the food that they sell is as safe as possible because they don't want consumers to blame them for a foodborne illness outbreak. You know, one of the biggest problems in this, or it's not really a problem, but it is definitely a reality in this country, is that food sales are pretty much static. Most families don't buy more food this year than they bought last year unless their family size increases. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make money in this industry, you have to do it by capturing consumers to your products and your brands. And food safety is a big part of that process. Hmm. Which foods do we commonly eat that are the most subject to contamination? Fresh produce is, is a big risk in terms of foodborne illness. Um, fresh produce has very little post-processing. Uh, it's not usually, you know, it's not cooked. Um, it's, it's, it, and so there, there's, a, there's a big risk in terms of food safety for sh- fresh produce, which kind of puts um, an additional spin on things because, of course, we all here eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's yeah, good I mean, for our health. We're creating and a rock in a hard place there, right? It really is because nutritionally that's certainly true. But as, in terms of food safety, fresh produce is a major risk. Um, mm-hmm. And we've seen outbreaks in recent years with melons, and spinach and jalapeno peppers and tomatoes. And one of the biggest risks, um, and, and this is something that we really learned after the spinach outbreak in the late, uh, late 2000s, or 2009, somewhere around there, was that um, sometimes fresh produce, when it sucks water into the inside of the plant, will carry the contamination. If the contamination is in the water, it will cont- carry the contamination into the inside of the food. And so the spinach that was making people sick was this triple washed spinach. But it doesn't matter how many times you wash it. If the contamination is on the inside of the plant, there's no way to get it out and still eat the, and still eat the fresh produce. Huh. And so fresh produce is a major risk in terms of food safety. Wow. I, I, you sort of have the feeling you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. <laughs> you know? To a large extent. Yeah, it's, it's easier when I can talk about things. I mean, you know, beef is a, is a major risk. Ground meats are a risk, things like that. Um, but when you talk about fresh produce, it really does create a, a, a conflict of interest between food safety and nutrition. Mm-hmm. Isn't it true that most people who get food poisoning get it from their own kitchens and their own carelessness in handling raw food, though? Certainly a lot of people who get sick do get sick from, from cross-contamination in their kitchens. Um, and I think most Americans, and, and I would count myself among these until I actually started to take coursework in food safety, don't really think about all of the things that they do in their own kitchens that do present a risk as far as foodborne contamination. But here's an important thing to remember. Even if you're, even if you're going to get sick from food that you're preparing in your own kitchen, the foodborne illness is coming into that kitchen somehow you know, salmonella or, or E. coli or, or Campylobacter or whatever it is that you're going to get sick from, from the cross-contamination in your kitchen, it's coming in on a food supply. And so if there's some way to reduce the risk of the food coming into our kitchens in terms of contamination, we can also reduce the risk that people will get sick from their own, from their own careless handling of food. Again, we're speaking with Dr. Courtney Thomas, visiting assistant professor of political science at Virginia Tech University here on AmericasDemocrats.org and talking a little bit about her book called In Food We Trust and some of the regulations and, and the different groups that are handling all the regulations of food. Um, you know, this, I, I, I kind of want to go back to something that you had mentioned earlier and, and along the lines of, of the split between Department of Agriculture and Food and Drug Administration. Why is the food safety regulation split between them? And and shouldn't there be one agency that regulates all food? And is there a move to perhaps consolidate that? Well, and again, the, um, the, the split really does come from the early attempts to regulate food safety in this country um, at the turn of the 20th century. So right. 1906, we see that split. Um, but the question, you know, should there be one agency that regulates food? You know, that's something that, that uh, policy experts have talked about for many years. And for, for a long time, the GAO recommended very strongly that there be one food safety agency in the United States with the sole responsibility to regulate food safety um, for all food products. And by the way, it's not just the FDA and the USDA. I mean, those are the big ones, but it's also the EPA. It's also the Trade Commission. It's also local health departments. I mean, there are literally dozens of federal and state agencies that have some small part of the food regulatory authority, some small part of this process. 
But, and, and this is what's very interesting, um, the GAO actually backed off of that proposition um, a few years ago after seeing what happened with the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and attempts to, to centralize um, intelligence and national security in a single agency at the federal level. And they realized that there were so many problems with that and there were so many, um, there were so many difficulties in creating that one central agency that they actually backed off of the idea of a single food safety agency and focus their efforts instead on reforming the FDA and the USDA as they currently exist, rather than this idea of creating a whole new separate agency. Now, there was a new food safety law enacted in 2013, I believe. It, is it too soon to tell if that's working? Yeah, that's the Food Safety Modernization Act, and it was passed in 2011, and yes, it's way too soon to know if that's going to work um, or what even that is going to mean. Um, it was passed in 2011. It has been through several years now of, of review, and you know, most people I don't think think about this, but when a law is passed by Congress, that's really just the first of many steps. And you know, laws that are passed by Congress are kind of the bare bones of what it is that we want to do in, forms, in terms of policy. But once Congress passes a law, that legislation goes to the agency, in this case the FDA, and the FDA has to look at the legislation and say, okay, how are we going to do this? How on a practical level are we going to have rules and practices and regulations to put these broad principles into action? And that's what the FDA has been doing over the past couple of years. So even though this, this legislation was passed several years ago, it hasn't been implemented in its entirety yet. And so there's no way to know what the impacts of that are going to be um, until we start to see implementation. And on top of that, despite the very best intentions when passing this legislation, um, one of the things that ended up happening was that it drew a lot from the early 20th century, the 1906 laws. The 1906 laws never classified foodborne bacteria and viruses, E. coli, salmonella, all of those, as adulterants under that framework. It is possible, it is possible that even though the Food Safety Modernization Act clearly intends to cover foodborne illness, it is possible that because it is not explicitly stated in the legislation that the federal courts will strike down efforts to do so once that legislation is, imp once that legislation is actually implemented. <laughs> That, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it was an oversight. I'm a, I, I can only assume that it was an oversight, oh but it's goodness. not explicitly there. Oh. And, and the federal courts have done this before um, when there have been efforts, um, and, and this was primarily on the part of the USDA, when there were efforts to govern foodborne illness. Uh, salmonella was the big one. The federal courts said you can't do it because that exceeds the statutory authority of the USDA in terms of food safety. And because this new legislation does not explicitly say that it is going to treat foodborne illness as an adulterant under the 1906 framework, it is possible that that entire food safety initiative will be declared by the federal courts to be beyond the statutory mandate of the FDA. I'm I'm left shaking my head. I I, yeah, I do I, that with frequency. <laughs> Mike, I guess you do. All right, before we let you go, uh, quick question for the benefit of all consumers: Isn't it true that the poll date on most groceries is meaningless in terms of health? That it's all about how a food tastes after too long on a shelf, as opposed Absolutely. to it being bad? Yeah. Absolutely. The dates that you see on foods, uh, the sell-by dates or the best if used by dates, those are not safety dates, um, they, and, they, and they aren't necessarily even quality dates, depending on, on how they're being used. They're inventory control dates. Those are put on there by food producers so that the producers and the suppliers can work with the distributors and the supermarket chains to make sure that food is circulating through the system at the rate that they want it to. It is absolutely not a safety, it is, it is not a safety date, it has no connotation for food safety. So I always tell people when you, when you want to know if a food is safe to eat, the, the, the three basic rules are look at it and see if it looks right, smell it and see if it smells right, and taste it and see if it tastes right. And if it looks okay, it smells okay, and it tastes okay, 
chances are, even if the date says that it's quote-unquote expired, the chances are it's perfectly safe to consume. And after those three things, if you're still standing, you're probably good to go. You're right? probably okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Courtney Thomas, visiting assistant professor of political science at Virginia Tech University. Check out her book. It's called In Food We Trust. Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for your time with us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again. Thanks so much. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Professor Kerry Nelson, a prominent progressive, explains why the anti-Israel boycott, divest, and sanction movement is counterproductive and fundamentally irrational. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Here's a random thought that might not have occurred to you. It's not easy being rich. Well, yes, there are all those things that money can buy to alleviate the burden of fabulous wealth. Things like servants, summers in Provence, private jets, and such. But as an article in the Wealth section of the New York Times reminds us, money buys things, not happiness. And the article reports that America's poor upper one percenters are not happy. The chief source of super-rich sadness? Overwork. It seems that our vaunted CEOs and Wall Street titans feel as though they're always on the clock, expected to be in charge of every little facet of their business. But before you fall into uncontrollable weeping over their suffering, let me give you the good news that whole flocks of psychologists, neuroscientists, and other healers are rushing to conquer this tragic malaise of the rich. They've even coined a term for the trauma, stress of high status. The main symptom of SHS syndrome, we're told, is the feeling of always being rushed for time. Excuse me, but if all these soothers of the elite think high status is stressful, they might examine the lives of those with low status. Try being a single mom with a couple of kids who's juggling two part-time fast food jobs and her kids' schedules while worrying about making the rent this month and then having her car break down. Yet the Times devotes a full page to the pseudo-misery of these pampered ones, even citing a prominent psychologist who laments that, quote, Wealthy people spend less time doing pleasurable things and more time doing compulsory things and feeling stressed. This is Jim Hightower saying, what? Less time on pleasurable things and more time doing, quote, compulsory things than that single mom? Get a grip. The sickness that has infected the wealthy class is not stress, but a plague of narcissism. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. The move by certain academics to boycott Israeli universities is really about opposing Israel as a Jewish state, says prominent professor Kerry Nelson. And we say hello to Kerry Nelson, emeritus professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and was president of the American Association of University Professors from 2006 to 2012. He has written or edited more than 25 books, including the new publication, The Case Against Academic Boycotts of Israel. Kerry Nelson, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Hi, good to be here. Uh, One of the big issues on college campuses today is a movement to divest from Israel and boycott and sanction Israeli universities. Now, that worked for those who opposed apartheid in South Africa, but what is the difference between South Africa and Israel? Um, Yeah, that's actually an important question. Um, uh, I could say that they're, you know, sort of on different continents, but um, taking the question more seriously, look, 
South Africa was in no respect a democratic country. A white minority uh, exercised power over disenfranchised and oppressed a black majority. Peter Beinart, a scholar from New York, likes to make a distinction, which I find helpful, between democratic Israel, which means Israel within its pre-1967 boundaries, and undemocratic Israel, which means Israel on the West Bank. So Israel, the nation that's recognized by so many countries in the world, is the Israel that's located you know, within roughly the 1967 boundaries. And it's a democratic country, actually. It's the only truly democratic country in the Middle East. And unlike South Africa, Israel has the, the government and the form of government, not necessarily the exact leaders, but the form of government that its citizens overwhelmingly want. South Africa had a form of government which its citizens overwhelmingly rejected. And it's, you know, the vast majority of its citizens supported the boycott of South Africa. Uh, of only a very tiny percentage of Israelis support a boycott of Israel. So, you know, there is, there's no basis of comparison between Israel proper and South Africa whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Now, the situation on the West Bank is different. Um, I think that this, the lives that Palestinians live on the West Bank, many of them at least, are unacceptable. I think they need their own country. Now, I'm in favor of a Palestinian state on the West Bank, exact borders to be determined, but nonetheless, the principle of a Palestinian state is one that I support. Um, the question is, how do you move in that direction? How do, you, how do you work toward that? By the way, the boycott of South Africa was a general economic boycott, and South African universities were never a specific focus of any boycott effort. BDS is actually trying to target Israeli universities, and that's a, you know, that's a fundamental violation of academic freedom. South African universities suffered along with the rest of the country, but no one said, let's go after South African universities. Mm-hmm. They were just part of a general economic boycott, and a general economic boycott of Israel is not on the table, and you know most countries in the world wouldn't cooperate with it anyway, including this one. Uh, it's not what BDS is proposing. Um, so that comparison is often made between Israel and South Africa by BDS <coughs> supporters and opponents of Israel generally. But I think it's really a completely illegitimate comparison. Now, you're an accomplished leader in higher education, longtime progressive. Some might even say radical in your politics. Should it be a big surprise to people that you're such a vigorous opponent of the boycott, divest, sanction movement? Well, I, the first thing to say, I guess, is that, you know, as you pointed out, I was president of the American Association of University Professors from 2006 to 2012. Uh, 2006 was actually the year that the AAUP issued its long, strong statement against all forms of academic boycotts. Um, so, you know, I supported that organization's position. I was president at the time that that statement was offered, and really my whole involvement with opposition to BDS began with fighting against academic boycotts, and that really starts in 2006. So, you know, um, I haven't been involved as long as the earth has been here, but, you know, I'm coming up on, the, oh, it's been involved for eight years in any case, in fighting academic boycotts as a specific activity. And the only academic boycott that anyone seems to be proposing is against Israel. So, you know, if it were against Yugoslavia, I'd be op- opposed to that as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, it goes beyond that. My interest in Israel and commitment to Israel is broader, but it starts with that opposition to singling out universities, which, you know, in Israel are about the most progressive institutions that you've got. And indeed, Many of the most vocal critics of Israeli government policy are faculty members and students at universities. So cutting off your conversation with them is like completely crazy and counterproductive. Makes no sense. You know, 
ideally BDS should be saying, let's have more conversations with these Israeli faculty and students who object to Israeli government policy, right? Uh, let's have fewer conversations with the Knesset, I guess, and more conversations with universities. So it's fundamentally irrational. And, um, you know, I consider it a progressive commitment to oppose uh, boycotts of universities. I think that, to me, that's a very progressive commitment in line with the kinds of causes I've embraced over the years. I also think it's, you know, it's um, an appropriately progressive commitment for me to support two states for two peoples, a Jewish state for Israelis and um, a Palestinian state, which will be a Muslim state for Palestinians. You know, there are there are people who are committed to a greater Israel that would encompass not only Israel proper, but also the West Bank. But I'm opposed to that. I think that there's no evidence that Israelis and Palestinians or Arabs actually want to live together. It seems to be the reverse. They don't much want to live together. Mm -hmm. So two states for two peoples, I think, is the remains the appropriate progressive commitment. We're speaking with Carrie Nelson, Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Israel's been boycotted by Arab states and others continuously since its founding in 1948. And since it hasn't worked, the boycott, what's the point of those who keep supporting it? They've gained well, no ground, so why why keep this up, and why not take on that that you know let's open up conversation and let's try and figure this out another way? Well, I mean, for example, what would what would my first political priority be? It would be ending settlement expansion east of the security barrier or the fence or the wall. That to me would be a political program worth pursuing because that that's a specific goal designed to promote a peace initiative. Um, but you said something very important, which was you said that Arab states have boycotted Israel since 1948. And that really is the key date. Most of us who understand to some degree the Israeli-Palestinian conflict realize that the conflict is in many ways still set in 1948. What will be the borders of the Jewish state? Does a Jewish state have a right to exist? What should the status of Arabs in the area be? These are, you know, should uh, Arabs who fled Israel in 1948 have the right of return? And should that mean just the people who actually fled? Or should it mean their millions of descendants have the right to return to Israel? These were the hot topics in 1948. And it's weird, but they're still a hot topic. In some ways, the whole struggle over Palestine has not advanced, you know, one inch past 1948. And that's sort of one of the tragedies of the situation. But the second half of your, your question was, why persist? Why should BDS persist in a project that has failed for more than half a century? And... One way of answering that is to say this failed because it's never been about boycotts. They know they can't win that battle. In hearts and minds. On campuses, it's about students and faculty into opponents of the Jewish state. That's really what it's all about. Every time there's a debate about boycotts, on a campus, some people get persuaded that Israel is the worst country in the world, maybe the worst country in the Milky Way, um, and their attitudes toward the Middle East and toward Israel change as a result. So the BDS movement is largely a movement trying to win the hearts and minds of people. And to a limited degree, they succeed every time. They certainly never reach out to a majority and persuade a majority of people, but they persuade some, and their movement grows as a result. And the U.S. is Israel's most important international ally, and it's not a good thing to turn faculty and students into, you know, sometimes violent or very angry opponents of the Jewish state. I think that's what the, what the struggle is about, and that's why BDS persists 
even though it's never going to win a boycott, you know, and or most dramatically, you know, you get these student votes for divestment from corporations and Israel's, you know, divest, sell your stock in Caterpillar, sell your stock, whatever. Mm-hmm. So you get students voting on that proposal. And then the university says, you know, thank you very much, but we make our own investment decisions. You know, the thanks, but no thanks. So no university, even even if when a boy, when a divestment proposal passes, no university is going to give up its financial uh, responsibility to turn a profit on its investment. So they just ignore it. So why have that in the first place? Because you win hearts and minds in the process. Is this BDS movement simply a form of anti-Semitism then? Well, that really is a complex but important question. If the key leaders of the BDS movement all say that the Jewish state has no moral right to exist, that it should be eliminated. Now, some of them are naive. Uh, Some of them are anti-Semitic. Some of them are deluded. But that's an anti-Semitic project, whether or not the people advocating it understand it or not. So, you know, BDS on its website says we we take no position on the one state, two state debate. But all of BDS's leaders say there can only be one state dominated by Arabs and the Jews have to give up their country. That's an anti-Semitic project even though some of these people are naive. I mean, to give you an example of naivete, the most prominent BDS philosopher probably in the world is Judith Butler of Berkeley, um, very distinguished faculty member. She believes that the, that the Jews should give up the state of Israel because they've been scattered across the world for so many centuries that really they're just, that's who they are. There are people without a country. They should realize that, that that is in their hearts and in their souls, and they should walk away from Israel as a result. Well, whether that's naive or delusional, I'm not sure, but it certainly isn't rational. But it, it gives you an example of the kind of uh, sort of gymnastics that BDS advocates have to go through in order to end up with that solution of of the dissolution of the Israeli state. Again, we're speaking with Kerry Nelson, Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, it, it does seem strange, does it not, that those who oppose Israeli policies don't say very much about the status of democracy and dissent in the world of radical Islam, including the Palestinian state. I mean, it's... Well, you know, one one's mouth drops open at that. At the very moment when we're watching primitive butchery taking place in Syria and Iraq and large numbers of Arabs being killed, Muslims being killed by other Muslims, only Israel is singled out as a rogue nation. And, you know, Israel isn't beheading people on, on, um, uh, on websites. Um, the, the singling out of Israel And the inability to compare the status of Israeli democracy with other countries in the world, and especially other countries in the Middle East, is just astonishing. There is is no justification for attacks on Israel that don't take on the responsibility of comparing the status of Israeli democracy with that of other countries in the area. That's really an irresponsible activity, and there, I think it has two components. One component is a form of anti-Semitism, and the other component is a form of left-wing political correctness. So in some ways, opposition to Israel is the membership card for joining the academic left these days, and in many ways the, left, the, the non-academic left as well. And it's no longer a rational position. It's something, it's a, a form of loyalty, a form of, um, of political correctness that people are expected to sign on to, whether or not they've analyzed it rationally. Mm-hmm. Now, 
before we let you go, you've personally been involved in this issue within the framework of academic freedom by opposing the hiring of an anti-Israel professor at Illinois. Shouldn't there be a wide spectrum of viewpoints on a faculty and the freedom to advance certain causes? Well, we have dozens of anti-Israel faculty at the University of Illinois. Dozens. Mm. There are departments that are dominated by anti-Israel faculty, and I'm sure we'll hire more. Um, so it's not, it's not a person's political position that's at issue. It's really what, what kind of work a person does is the work of high quality. Does the person mount anti-Israel arguments that are rational, that are founded in evidence? In other words, what kind of scholar is the person? And, you know, I am sorry to say it, but I believe um, that the person whose uh, appointment I objected to is not a scholar of the quality appropriate to the University of Illinois. I have friends on campus that are opposed to Israel. Um, I mean, it's commonplace. Um, I, my department head, whom I was the chair of the search committee who hired him, um, is pretty BDS sympathetic. Um, wow. It's, you know, we have a large number of anti-Israel faculty here, and I have no problem with hiring others. I have problem with hiring a mediocre scholar who has hate in his heart. Okay. Gary Nelson, Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, latest publication, The Case Against Academic Boycotts of Israel. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. We look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks for having me. All right. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press and his guest, Politico's Stephen Shepard. Uh, it's a little time out between uh, elections, but there is really uh, no time out for politics here in the country because we just roll from one to the other. Stephen Shepard is the campaigns and elections editor for Politico. Uh, joining us in studio this morning. Hello, Stephen. Nice to see you. Morning. Good to see you. On your way to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. As I think everybody is at this uh <coughs> Either today or tomorrow. Hopefully t today, because tomorrow the weather's supposed to be much worse. Oh, yeah. Well, I will be, too, a little bit later <laughs> this morning. So th uh, it, this is a nice way stop on the way to National <laughs> Airport. It's nice of you to uh, work us into your schedule uh, this morning at well. Uh, and, and it's a big day for a certain New York congressman, correct? That's right. Congressman Michael Graham, Republican of Staten Island, is expected to plead guilty today to one charge of tax evasion. He's facing a 20-count federal indictment Ooh. right now in court, and this is the deal they've worked out. Apparently, the deal does not include a, uh, a, a resignation. You know, oftentimes federal prosecutors, when they're dealing with public officials, will make a plea deal contingent upon their, reserva uh, their, their resignation because there's a public good when it comes to getting convicted felons out of office. Right. Uh, yeah. In this case, that doesn't appear to be the case. And it looks like, based on the count that he's going to expect it to plead to, and, and, you know, we don't know all the details just yet. Uh, it won't be revealed until this afternoon in open court. Uh, it looks right now like the judge is going to have some leeway when it comes to sentencing. So this is tax evasion, is that right? That appears to be the deal that he's worked out, yeah, tax evasion. Uh, he owned, prior to becoming a congressman, he owned a chain of health food stores called Health Delicious in New York City. And uh, he had workers working off the books and a number of uh, improprieties apparently associated with that. Allegedly, I should say, now, until he's this, actually pleaded guilty. This is a felony, right? The count to which he's expected to plead guilty is a felony, yes. So, I uh, I'll have to double check, but I thought you could not be a member of Congress and be a felon. You cannot be a member. You can't vote if you're a felon. 
but right, vote for right. yourself. But you can run for Congress. You recall in Louisiana earlier this year, former Governor Edwin Edwards, convicted felon who yeah. does not have voting rights, uh, could not vote for himself, ran for Congress and lost in a, in a December general election uh, earlier this month. Uh, so it, so it's, it's, it, it's, yeah, you can be a congressman. So it, it would not... If he pleads guilty to a felony, it would not automatically disqualify him. That's correct. Uh, now there in, are in some, other words, he would not automatically lose his office. That's correct. Now, there are some House rules that do enable, uh, may enable Speaker John Boehner and Republican leadership to uh, first remove him from all com- committees and take away his voting rights on the House floor. But he would still be the congressman from New York's 11th congressional district. And just reelected, correct? Correct. Just reelected by more than 15 points, really a staggering margin for a guy facing 20 counts and, and uh, up to 20 years in jail, roughly. Uh, and it's a swing district. It's a district that was basically 50-50 in both 2008 and 2012 between uh, President Obama and the Republican nominee. So you're talking about a district that Democrats really thought at the outset of the election cycle, even before the indictment against Grimm, that they had a good chance to pick up. Then Grimm gets indicted. They think they've got it in the bag, but their nominee really imploded down the stretch. Yeah. Wow. And now we so, could we could have a special election next year. That's what I was going to say. If, if, he, you know. yeah, if he does step down, uh, under, right. and there'll be intense pressure on him to step yes, down. The Republicans difficult. don't want th- th- this guy hanging around their necks. No, right. you, and you look at what John Boehner has done since becoming Speaker, and uh, any sort of hint of scandal, they have pushed the person out very quickly. Chris Lee, the congressman from upstate New York, western New York, uh, who took the shirtless photo on in Craigslist. Uh, Mark Souter, Republican of Indiana, with an extramarital affair with one of his uh, part-time staffers. Uh, Troy Radel, congressman from Florida, who was con- uh, pled guilty to cocaine possession and resigned right uh-huh. when he pled yeah. guilty. Uh, the Republican le- House Republican leadership has done a very good job, especially remembering the lessons of 2006 and Mark Foley, of really trying to put these scandals behind them as quickly as possible. This could be a challenge, though. Michael Grimm has is, is, mm-hmm. uh, really uh, been steadfast in, in saying that, first of all, he's been innocent, which appears not to be the case if he's about to plead guilty, uh, but also in saying that he's not going anywhere, running for re-election confidently, winning easily. You know, he's got to feel pretty confident that the at least the voters of Staten Island might still be behind him, even if House Republicans are not. Right. So coming out of uh, here at the end of 2014, uh, which was a bad, bad year for Democrats and progressives, uh, looking ahead to 2016, I guess... Um, the focus, of course, will be on the White House, but also uh, the Senate. And um, some people feel that the Senate will be – Democrats will have an easier task in 2016 than they had in 2014. Well, it seems likely the Democrats at minimum will probably net seats in the Senate in 2016. There are six or seven Republican-held seats that are, are in states that President Obama won in both 2008 and 2012. We're looking at Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey, New Hampshire Senator Kelly Ayotte, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, who may not run for Senate if he runs for president, uh, Illinois Senator Mark Kirk, Ohio Senator Rob Portman, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson. These are uh, seats that that Democrats feel like they can probably uh, Mm -hmm. at least pick up one or two. Uh, The problem is they're going to need four or five. Uh, depending. Uh, they'll need four if, so they the, win, if they win the presidential election in 2016. They'll need five if they lose in order to get control of the Senate. Right. So the map, as they say, is uh, fa- favorable to Democrats, as it was favorable to Republicans in 2014. Absolutely. It's just the opposite in 2016. There are only really two vulnerable Democrats on the map right now uh, in 2016. That's Colorado Senator M- Michael Bennett, who you'll recall just barely beat Ken Buck in 2010, uh, and then Nevada Senator Harry Reid. Uh, that's always a, a, a tough race and always where Republicans are going to focus a lot of uh, a lot of interest. You know, they, they would love for the Republican governor there, Brian Sandoval, who was just reelected by an overwhelming margin. They'd love for him to run. Indications are he might not be crazy about the idea. Uh, you certainly know that the National Republican Senatorial Committee is going to be checking in with him on a monthly basis until he decides that. One of the... Um uh, one of the things that hurt Democrats this year, I think, were so many um, solid Democrats who retired. Max Baucus of Montana, Carl Levin of Michigan, who probably, just because of their longevity and the good job that they'd done, would have held on to those seats, even though they were 
in questionable states, certainly Montana. Right. Uh, do we see? You, see, like, you, you just mentioned Harry Reid. Are we sure Harry Reid's going to run for re-election? He says he's going to run for re-election, though you can never be sure. Uh, there is one other Democratic seat that could potentially be in play uh, if the incumbent retires. That's uh, California Senator Barbara Boxer. You know, uh, there are no shortage, as you know, being yeah. California, oh, yeah. there yeah. are no there's no shortage of Democrats waiting their turn for one of these Senate seats or the governor's seat to open up in California. And now that California has this top two primary system, there is some concern if Boxer does retire and you have Democrats uh, from Gavin Newsom to Kamala Harris to uh, Eric Garcetti to just, I mean, any number of the, the members of the congressional delegation who say, hey, this is my best chance at a Senate seat. Uh, I'm going to go for it. That could, in an all-party primary, if there's only one or two viable Republicans in the race, you could be looking at a, even a situation where it was two Republicans in the general election. You know, just there's so much uh, in doubt in that kind of situation. So we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, other Democrats who could retire, Barbara Mikulski in Maryland. You just saw Maryland go red at the gubernatorial level. It's a lot harder to imagine. Uh, at the pres- in a presidential election year yeah. for a federal office, any Republican having a chance. You know, you, you'll recall that uh, in 2006 in the open seat, the Sarbanes seat, Michael Steele ran a pretty tough race against Ben Cardin but lost. Uh, it's difficult to imagine sort of Republicans being able to win that one. And there's, there's probably no shortage of Democratic members of Congress to run for Barbara Mikulski's seat were she to step down, correct? Absolutely not. You know, uh, there are a couple Chris, of Democrats. Chris Van Hollen, for Chris sure. Chris Van Hollen, for sure. Uh, if he doesn't see Unless, sort of House leadership as his right. way forward, uh, you know, he's John sort of Sarba- blocked by John, Hoyer. John Sarbanes. John Sarbanes. Uh, John Delaney out in Western Maryland has uh, big ambitions in statewide office, though he's thought maybe to be more interested in running against Governor elect Harry, uh, Larry Hogan in 2018. Uh, potentially even Dutch Ruppersberger, who, who flirted with a gubernatorial run for months and decided not to do it this year, he might be interested in running for uh, running for Senate, particularly given his role uh, in the House Intelligence Committee. Sort of, you know, you're not going to be the, ch- uh, the the majority chairman anytime soon with Republicans hold on the House. Uh, Steny Hoyer, probably not, just because he's uh, retirement age. Right. I mean, he could mm-hmm. continue in the House, but starting a whole new six right. years a six in the year term would be... is, Yeah, two years in the House, it's easier to, to see the path forward and not retire. Six years in the Senate, it's a long time. All right. Steve Shepard here with us. We're taking a look, believe it or not, already at 2016 uh, in the Senate. We'll talk about the House. And there's also that thing called the White House that's up in 2016, of course, with some interesting developments on that front. Democratic strategist Peter Fenn in for the entire next hour as a friend of Bill. And we'll be joined by Adam Green, head of the Progressive Change Campaign Committee. They are holding a big event. Uh, They've already held one. They've got another big event tomorrow. Uh, All about urging Elizabeth Warren to run for president in 2016. Uh, Stephen Shepard covers campaigns and elections for Politico in studio with us this morning on his way to the airport for his flight to Chicago. Hello, (laughs) Hello, Steve. Again, thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Uh, Is this Elizabeth Warren plane going to get off the ground? (laughs) Well, you know, everything uh, you hear and read is just that she is not going to run if Hillary Clinton runs. Um, She's publicly endorsed Hillary Clinton in a letter. uh, But she, until that point comes, and even after that, uh, she does have an important role to play in the party. Uh, she wants to move the party in a specific direction, a direction that is a little bit more progressive, a, a direction that is a little bit more populist. And, uh, you know, I, I think she's going to continue to play that role. That said, if, if Hillary Clinton decides not to run, um, she sort of <laughs> supplanted <laughs> Vice President Biden as the the right. favorite almost if Hillary Clinton decides not to run, which would be sort of a crazy uh, – can you imagine the 48 hours after Hillary Clinton announces she's not running for president and sort of all the moves that will be made at that point? Um, I, I think she's sort of the first name on the list after that. But she'd be in it in a minute. Yeah. And, and you know, the work she's done over the past two years since being elected to the Senate, uh, she's positioned herself really, really well in that event. Um, that said, if Hillary Clinton runs, it's it, she. I don't think she's going to run. It doesn't seem feasible. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. Yes. Yeah. Right. Bernie Sanders? Um, 
You know, I, I, I don't know. I know he's traveled to some of these early states. Uh, it's easier for him to go to New Hampshire. I know he was in Iowa the other day. Uh, he had a good response in Iowa. They had a yeah, no, couple he's, of good events out there. Good, yeah. good piece in the New York Times. Yeah, he's someone who can excite a uh, certain element of uh, Democrats over there. Uh, one of the problems is he's not a Democrat. So, uh, you know, he's going to face, obviously, a challenge. It's a good opportunity for him. I know when he gave his uh, filibuster on the Senate floor, he used sold some books and, and got his name out there, and, and this could be a good opportunity for him to do the same thing. Uh, but I found on the other on, – by the way, and I'm firmly in the camp of somebody has to challenge Hillary in the primary for no other reason than to um, introduce the issues, progressive issues, that Hillary would never otherwise talk about. So, And, and that's not an anti-Hillary statement. It's just the Democratic Party, I think, needs – and she needs a good, healthy primary – on the Republican side, I was really stunned last week to see, um, I think it was CNN, the CNN poll, where uh, among Republicans they said, okay, who's your choice for 2016? Number one was Mitt Romney, but number two was Ben Carson. You know, not Chris Christie, not Rick Perry, not Marco Rubio, you know, not Rand Paul. Ben Carson. Really? Yeah, no, the Ben Carson phenomenon is one largely driven by uh, sort of talk radio, cable television. Uh, a lot of conservatives admire the way he stood up in front of President Obama and uh, at the National Prayer Breakfast and, and told him all the things he was wrong about, and, and they admire that. Uh, that said, right now, the Ben Carson for president phenomenon appears to just be a way for uh, – direct mail vendors and other folks associated with this pack that is trying to encourage him to enter, the, supposedly trying to There's encourage a, him to a enter run, the race. D- d- as we're going to talk to Adam Green about the run Elizabeth run, this is a run Ben run. Right. And and right now, all it seems to be doing is en- enriching the bill, uh, trying to, uh, you know, they're raising all this money, $12 million, but they're spending just about as much money uh, in order to raise that money through direct mail, uh, it's very good for the vendors and very good for the postal service <laughs> and for uh, for everyone making money off that. But it, you know, and it does demonstrate to some extent that there is, particularly within the base, a uh, they like this guy from what they've heard about him. Now, will they like him when he's on a stage with ten other Republicans who are? Office holders who have engaged in political debates before, who have natural geographic bases, yeah. who will have the resources to maybe just travel to these early states, who have the big money donors behind them. Uh, will they like him as much then? Uh, you know, it seems pretty unlikely. Uh, we haven't had a, a true outsider can- major party candidate in a very long time. Uh, but, you know, you never know. Yeah. And and he's he said some pretty crazy things, too, in comparing... Obamacare, the worst thing to happen to us since the slavery. Nazi. Yeah, yeah, uh, or yeah. the Nazi. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he's, uh, yeah, and, and he'll have to reckon with all that uh, in front of, of more polished politicians uh, when it comes time to, if he does run, when it comes time to, for, the, say, the uh, summer and, when they start having these debates. And the other thing that's happened on that side of the aisle uh, for tour 2016 is Jeb Bush making it not quite, but almost official last week. Yeah, no, uh, it, it's definitely a sign to folks who would line up behind him, uh, the establishment donors who supported his brother, that keep your powder dry. I'm giving this serious thought. I might really do it. Uh, so don't line up with other candidates yet. I'll get back. You know, he's going to have to get back to them by February or March with a with a final decision in order to keep them locked up. The longer it drags on, especially as other candidates jump in and he doesn't move off of this statement, the more difficult it's going to be to do that. But for now, he he does sort of plant his flag and say, hey, guys, you know, rally around me for now. And then if I decide not to do it, then you can go. But but I'm really thinking about it. I'm more serious this time than I have been in the past. Right. Which was uh, particularly, I think, a message to the uh, to the Mitt Romney people. You know, if you're looking for a good, established, safe establishment candidate, you don't have to wait for Mitt. Right, and and the um, Romney boomlet, you know that that was a big threat to him. Yeah, right. Even if Romney doesn't do it, it, it and and it seems really unlikely, uh, but even if Romney didn't do it, the longer Jeb went without saying something, the more we were going right. to keep talking about him. Steve Shepard from uh, Politico, Politico dot com. That's all for America's Democrats dot org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Courtney Thomas, Carrie Nelson, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. 
Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For americasdemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate.